<clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is Noam Perig and I'm a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales here in Sydney. And I would like to begin this part of the conversation by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Euro nation and to pay my respect to the elderly, past, present and emerging, and also to extend my respect to any indigenous person, any indigenous child who is watching this recording and this conversation today. In, and it is a great pleasure to be able to spend the next half an hour or so talking with my dear colleague, Professor John Tobin from the University of Melbourne, for following from his conversation and his presentation earlier on. So this conversation will follow from his talk uh, about uh, uh, the range of theories of child rights. Uh, and we'd like to spend the coming minutes uh, talking about and to explore uh, some of the themes that John uh, brought up a little further and to think together about some new and emerging issues um, in so you heard a lot about child rights uh, theories uh, uh, and, and the utility uh, of rights-based approach. And I was wondering, John, if we can maybe talk about two other points uh, uh, that we see developing and emerging in child rights uh, uh, scholarship. Um, and the first one was maybe uh, uh, the utility and presumably the, the limitations uh, of the convention itself as a document uh, and of the rights-based approach that you have presented, uh, um, mainly in, in, in with respect to new events uh, in children's life. And I'm thinking about uh, children's online living uh, and how the physical and the virtual might be blurred with respect to their education and to their leisure time. Uh, and we know this is a safe for a privileged uh, group of children, uh, but throughout the pandemic, more and more children began to engage with online living. Uh, and there is a question whether when we speak about protection and privacy and empowerment and education and health, um, uh, how the convention uh, can play a role in regulating this environment for them. And another issue that is emerging in the last few years is climate justice uh, and climate justice litigation, which is use, which use either human rights uh, uh, discourse and human rights law, uh, and those litigations or attempts to use child rights discourse in this space uh, in, in, in cases that brings, uh, uh, that see children as litigants or in cases that children are excluded from, excluded from the litigation or are not part of the, of the litigation, but nonetheless their rights and their entering are being discussed. Um, and in a similar vein, and maybe that will be the second half of our conversation, I thought of like exploring the frontiers of child rights a bit further um, with respect to two issues. There is a fundamental question about the, the, the relevancy of the convention to children from different parts of the world. Um, and in recent years, we see some engagement from uh, post-colonial and decolonial perspective or third world approaches to international law, engagements of these bodies of scholarship with the convention trying to rethink or maybe to undermine or to call into question the relevancy of this uh, universal uh, document to children from different parts of the world. Um, in a similar vein, uh, we might want to speculate if we have time and the appetite about how a fourth optional protocol might look like. Uh, so the talk didn't speak much about the three optional protocols that we already have, one with respect to uh, trafficking and, uh, uh, and prostitution, and the second protocol uh, that speaks about child pornography, and the third protocol that speaks about communication uh, mechanism. But I wonder, given that the world is changing and international human rights law is changing and all of those emerging issues, whether we might want to think about a fourth of our protocol, and if so, how it might uh, how it might look like, which topics it, it should cover, uh, maybe it should reduce some of the elements of the convention or ex expand the convention, but we might get to that uh, uh, later later today. Thanks, Norman. Um, great to see you again as well. And of course, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation, paying my respect to the eldest past, present, emerging. And just in the background, you'll see here a local point of significance for me and my family with living, learning, and I suppose enjoying life in the lands of the Wurundjeri people, never ceded. Um, and lots of work to be done in that space for us as Australians to identify and restore the harm that's been done as well, particularly, of course, in a context like this conversation around the harm experienced by Indigenous children and their families. So you've given me a lot of things to think about there, Noam. So I'll try and unpack them. And if I miss things, please let me know. But let's start then with this idea that is the convention fit for purpose in terms of contemporary issues confronting children. And the two you've identified, I think, are obviously really important. One is this issue of online living or digital environments, um, things that didn't exist back in the 80s at all. It didn't exist when I was at university. Um, I used to hand write my assignments. I wasn't sort of um, using chat GTP to draft out um, answers to questions, of course, students can now do as, if they wanted to as well. So there's new challenges there. Second, of course, is climate change, which we probably knew about back in the 80s, but we were doing very little to address that as well. 
So let's come to the issue, I suppose, the broader question. To what extent is the convention enduring in its relevance? And I think it's a really important point. And, you know, I'd be really keen to get your thoughts on this as well. I think part of the, what I want to make in the initial uh, overview of, of a rights-based approach is that I think in many respects, the convention is un, uh, misunderstood and under-investigated in terms of the ideas and principles and values it tries to address. And I think they're pretty progressive for their time, which in some ways is not surprising, um, you know, emerging in the back of the sort of various other movements around uh, human rights, women, um, race, disability, et cetera, in the 70s and 80s. So I think that's the first point. So we shouldn't just say that we should dismiss something because it was drafted in the 1980s because things have changed in the, in the 2020s as well. Um, and I think we need to investigate and uh, examine more carefully some of those key principles and their relevance too. So that's the first point. So let's then move then to the issue of online environments. And you're absolutely right. Uh, this is a serious challenge for how we think about um, children and children's rights. And of course, we do have the general comment on children's rights in the digital environment. And I was sort of reflecting that before I came online this morning and looking at that 125 paragraphs known of content about how the convention relates to all the various issues that exist under that particular context. I got to myself wondering, though, to what extent do those 125 paragraphs actually give clarity to some of the really thorny questions that are being tackled on a day-to-day -day basis by policymakers, parents, teachers, and, of course, children themselves. My thinking is this, that, in fact, you know, if we think about um, how we historically have gone about engaging with the media and children, pre-digital media. And so the emphasis we've had around a welfare or protective-based model where we focus on vulnerabilities. My thinking is that if we think at and look at the convention, clearly we've got obviously that lens around protection that still exists, but now we see provision and participation, those three Ps, to keep things simple, as being, I think, a broad model. And you know, I wrote on this issue actually last year saying that I think that that rights-based framework still has a really important role to play in informing how we think about our response to digital environments in all contexts as well. And, and the point I suppose I'd be making is that a rights-based approach gives us a very sharp and distinct focus as a theory, a model, a paradigm for addressing the challenges there to historical, really largely welfarist approaches around, we just got to make sure we do no harm. And so once we draw that, bring that into the equation, um, we start thinking, okay, well, maybe um, we can see, in fact, the opportunities that the digital environment provides to enable realization of rights. So it's an enabler of rights, which sort of aligns with the provision, but it's also, of course, a space in which children are participating actively as well. And there's some really good research around the ways in which children use online environments to enable them to realise their Article 12 rights. So, you know, I'm less concerned than others about whether the convention's fit for purpose in that area. Clearly, it lacks detail. I mean, Article 17, if you read it carefully, is, is of a different time. Mass media is, you know, talking about your big broadsheets in your television and movies, not talking about TikTok and WhatsApp and Facebook. So there's clearly issues around there. And that might come to your point around, you know, what's the fourth protocol look like? Maybe that's the space where we'd want to be providing more guidance. But I still think that the core principles, the theoretical underpinnings of the convention around that broader notion of what childhood looks like, the empowerment element, I think gives us a pretty important framework to think about how we can start to respond to and engage with the way in which online worlds intersect with children's lived experiences as well, in a way that doesn't sort of focus on vulnerabilities, but does enable children to become active participants in creating content and understanding content. And I think, in fact, in enabling to enjoy agency as well. So I think um, there's really great opportunities there, but it does require us as adults um, and policymakers to provide the scaffolding and systems that allow for children to realise that capacity. And this is, I suppose, where we see the convention working really effectively to, to recognise the evolving capacities of children and say, hang on a second, look, you know, a six-year-old, you know, when they're navigating TikTok or Facebook, they need a bit of help around that space as well, right? Um, or maybe sometimes they need to be not ex uh, exposed to it too. So providing that scaffolding education support so we get to the point where the child of posting 16, 17, 18 is fairly capable of both navigating harm, but also allowing participation and agency as well. And then, of course, you've got the whole regulatory framework around privacy, which extends, I think, both to adults and children as well. Additional considerations for children, obviously, but I think we I think we can manage that if we think about those core principles, perhaps more than we have historically as well. So that's sort of my initial take on the online environment as well. You know, and I think we've got new emerging issues. So sharing is one of those things that's come up as well. And that's something we've never really thought about. And 
you know, parents like you and I, I think I want to share photos of my kids with the rest of the world. I'm really proud of them. But this is where I think a rights-based approach is kind of important, right? Because it says, just have a bit of a pause, mum and dad um, or parents and say, you know, is that in fact in the child's best interest? Are we in protecting the, the, the child both in the here in terms of the privacy rights and in the future as well? And so I think in some respects, we can see a rights-based approach and the theories underpinning that actually giving us a new lens to think about those practices that most of us wouldn't initially challenge. It seems harmless. We post a few photos of a young child in a bath or running around the backyard, but actually um, the convention and a rights-based approach makes us pause and think, well, actually, is that in the interest of the child in enabling their rights or in fact, is it about my interest as a parent? So I suppose it starts to recalibrate those conversations which give us new insights, which I think is exciting. I'm not saying we can resolve that here today between you and me, um, but I do know colleagues are working this as a, as a way of using rights as a theory to really navigate those spaces, which become, I think, quite complex. Um, but I think the convention does have a role to play there. And I wouldn't say it's useless at all, but in fact, I think it's got some really important insights to offer as well. That's my take on that. I'm happy to move on to um, the climate change debate. I'm also happy to respond to any reflections you may have yourself because you've got expertise too, right? So it's, you know, yeah. any thoughts I think you you offer no. would be useful for our, for our audience to hear as well. So this is about like, I think following from what you were saying and like thinking about those issues and think sharing thing is probably like one of the ones that you are, as a parent and as an adult, you are dealing with on a daily basis, either when you make a decision whether to like share whatever you have here uh, with the rest of the world or when you consume uh, uh, what other parents are sharing. Um, and, and the thing is, it's, it's a new, it's a new way to be a parent. It's a new way and different way to be a child. I mean, we have our own childhood pictures, but they are stuck in my parents' drawer somewhere and the rest of the world won't see them. Uh, maybe my kids will see them one day, uh, if they're going to visit their grandparents. Uh, but now it's all potentially out there, but going back to your point, I think so it's a new phenomena, but the convention and the rights-based approach gives us a good starting point of how to deal with this new way. But the principles remain the same. If we think about, and if we center children's and, and, and children and their rights and their interests in our decision-making process, in, in our decision whether to share their pictures online or not, so the, the principles are there, and the way of thinking about the world from children's point of view has been introduced by the convention. I don't think that has changed. So now it's been manifested in different ways and maybe present new challenges for for adults. Uh, um, but that's adults problem. It's not children's problem. I think the principles that underlines the convention are still valid uh, and children can expect that they will be that they will be continued to be fulfilled if ever they were like uh, uh, fulfilled to begin with from 18s onward uh, in, in these new ways of being a parent and these new ways of being of being a child. So privacy and best interest and participation haven't lost their currency. Uh, uh, because new ways of being a child have been emerged I mean, because of the pandemic or because of the technological uh, uh, developments. Um, but we are still in a situation like I think like we were in the 80s where policymakers, uh, politicians and, and parents are not either informed or convinced by their need uh, uh, to protect the rights and interests of their children. So the, pro the problems that we have 30 and 35 years ago remains and are not with children, nor with the, this legal mechanism that the UN has created, uh, yeah. rather with the implementation and the conception of adults. And we have like two or three generations of adults ignoring this convention since it was uh, adopted. Um, so, so there is a question of whether we should nuance our understanding of Article 17, the right to information or best interest or, or privacy with respect to new developments, right? Privacy, it's, it's not what it used to be. Uh, the, our, our information is exposed, our future might be compromised. Uh, um, here in Australia, we had this massive uh, data breaches of ID thefts uh, that can compromise children's future uh, uh, to, a, to a large extent. Uh, so maybe we should think about their privacy interest in that context too. But privacy is there, it's part of the convention, uh, uh, and it's a right that adults, lawyers have been dealing with quite some time. Um, so I think unlike against those calls, like Philip Birman made like almost 10 years ago, the convention is aging, so maybe it didn't tackle new phenomena, but the principles most likely are still relevant, even in this new uh, new era or eras of different ways of, of being a child uh, um, these days. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. And I think you made a good point, though. That the issue isn't the CRC and the principles. The issue is that adults don't necessarily value or understand those principles and therefore don't use them to inform their practice. And that's the challenge. Implementation, awareness raising education, not just of children, their rights, but of course, adults who then accept it and internalize those values. And I don't look quite there. I think 
certainly in Australia where you and I both live, there's still a very strong welfarist approach as to how we think about children. And that, I think, it undermines the capacity for us to realise the vision that the convention offers as well. So, no, I, I think they're really good points to make too. Uh, moving to your second point, because I'm conscious of time, I, I think this is the other great challenge of our time, as everyone talks about as well, human rights and climate change and human rights and the environment. And, you know, it's a, it's a really complex space. And as you would know, any, and also our viewers would know, there's a draft general comment currently being sort of finalised on children's rights and the environment with a special emphasis on climate change. And I was looking at it again prior to coming on this morning, I think there's 123 paragraphs um, that are there. And I, and I, and I encourage the, the, the listeners to sort of look at that and say, well, what does that tell us about how we understand the relationship between children's rights and the environment and climate change? And is the convention again fit for purpose? I think um, there's a couple of observations I want to make there. One is that the very process by which this general comment was, in fact, um, um, drafted, I think, is significant, um, very much initiated because of the advocacy of children around the world. So much a response of the committee of adults to what children were agitating for. And obviously, Greta Thunberg is the obvious spokesperson there. But the committee have responded to her and her colleagues' agency and activism, which I think is not insignificant around what impact the convention's having. And then I looked at the numbers, I think 7,400 children have been involved in the consultation, about 103 states. So for me, that says something really important about process. So what we're seeing here is Article 12 sort of creating, I suppose, a stimulus for the Committee on the Rights of the Child to really enable and empower young people to have a say in things that they think are relevant to them as well. So this is, I think, an example of where the principles are informing practice for issues that weren't anticipated or identified back in 1980. So clearly, the, you know, Article 24 refers to the, the environment, but it's only in very general terms. It's not in anything acknowledging climate change, as, of course, you wouldn't expect so, you know, is it for purpose, I think in the same line we talked about prior uh, about online learning, there's a theory, I think, that exists in the convention that is equally applicable to new issues like climate change, both in terms of the substantive content, what are we trying to do to change, but the process we're using to actually generate change as well. And so you're seeing that actively happening, that model of child empowerment, child agency, child activism, informing and shaping the very content of a document that in theory should inform the way in which governments go about responding to climate change and its impact on children in the past and in the future as well. So, you know, is it for purpose? You know, you wouldn't say it's perfect, but certainly it's giving those foundational principles that generate a voice, right? Um, a voice for young people in an area which um, historically they've been entirely neglected. And as you well know, in Australia, our government doesn't want to hear that voice. It wants to um, delegitimize it, discredit it as well. And our courts don't want to recognize any special duty. Okay, the Sharma case is an example of that. And you know about it in great detail, I might elaborate as well. But then you compare and contrast that with other things happening in the human rights space. So the Billy v. Australia case around the Torres Strait Islander um, complaints, we saw the role of human rights in trying to tackle the impact of climate change on, you know, Torres Strait Islander families, including their children as well. So, you know, I'm optimistic about the capacity for human rights to play a really important role in responding to climate change, recognising, of course, the limits. Okay, this is a classic example, isn't it, between, you know, there's a really strong environmental movement as well and a really strong human rights movement. We don't want to see human rights trying to colonise all the efforts that have been made by climate change activists, environmental activists over the years. But there's a complementarity there, I think, that is important. And if we can be using litigation as a tool to put pressure on states to address the human rights implications of climate change, then that pressure should be used. I think there's now, again, I was reading a thousand cases around the world in the last five years around climate change, many of which are trying to use ideas that are taken from human rights. And that's not surprising, right? Because what we're saying is at the end of the day, there's an interest children have or adults have in relation to environment. And there's obligations that the states have to make sure those interests are realised. Now, some of those cases aren't successful, but others, of course, are. So, you know, we think about the, the, the underpinnings of a rights-based model. It's, it's that there's an interest somebody has, in this case, at children, in terms of the impact on their lives, and both now and the future. There's also obligations on states to try and address it too. So, you know, again, I'd say it might be an imperfect match, but it doesn't mean we'd be saying it's a... Um, a model that has no relevance at all to how we might think about responding to climate change too. What I think is missing though from the general comment, this is me thinking it aloud, is that I don't think it tells the reader explicitly 
why a rights-based approach is different to current models that are currently in play. And I think that's something we need to be doing this space to really clarify, well, what's the dominant model at work now and how is this model different and why should we adopt it as well? So again, that's something you want to think about too, but that I think is just an issue around advocacy and awareness raising that we need to be addressing. Otherwise, it's a bit overwhelming, 125 paragraphs of content for the policymaker, for the advocate uh, about what it means to think about human uh, climate change through a rights-based lens. But I'll leave it there and again, throw back to you for any observations. I know you've done a lot of work around the Sharma case, so your reflections I think would be of relevance to our audience as well. Yeah, thank you. So just for those who are not familiar with the Australian context of the Sharma case that John mentioned is a case where a group of children uh, uh, brought a case uh, against the New South Wales Minister uh, uh, for the environment for granting license for uh, a new mining uh, uh, in the state, uh, arguing that their best interest hasn't been taken into account when thinking of whether a new mine should be open or not. Um, on first instance, the court found that the minister has breached the duty of care for children. Uh, so in, as, a, as a zoom out, we have no uh, federal nor state-based human rights act. Uh, as John mentioned, it's all very paternalistic and welfare-based approach. And this is what the, this is the language that the litigation used. Uh, it was a clear uh, welfareist case where the court found that the, indeed the, the minister uh, has breached the duty of care uh, for children and duty of care, which is not stipulated explicitly in the legislation. Uh, it was drawn from common law principles of duty of care towards the vulnerable uh, uh, me member of society, aka children in our case. Uh, and let's park the conceptualization of children as those internal victims for a moment. Um, but then again, the minister, speaking about backlash and the utility of litigation, the minister had no shame for appealing this case, uh, arguing that they don't have any duty of care towards children, uh, which one would imagine that a politician in his right mind or in her right mind won't do. Uh, won't go to the court and won't go to the press saying, I have no duty of care towards children. But nonetheless, it did happen in this case. Uh, and the Court of Appeal, unfortunately, uh, accepted this argument. Uh, so the law of the land, as it stands at the moment, at least in New South Wales, is that the Minister of, uh, of the Environment has no duty of care towards children, uh, nor towards uh, future generations. Um, so, I mean, so in that, on the one hand, the Sharma case was quite successful in showing how children can bring a case to, uh, uh, to the court, the advocacy and the attention, the public attention around it was huge. Uh, the initial victory was seized as a moment of success uh, and was celebrated, uh, um, despite the shortcomings of, 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 of the actual judgment. But nonetheless, on appeal, it all went backwards to an extent. Uh, and there is a question of, and that's the cause of like uh, tactical litigation and, and cause lawyering. Uh, that's, in, not, that's not a new phenomenon. You win some, you lose some, and then you pay prices when, when you lose and when politicians uh, are winning uh, the day in court. Um, but the principles remain. What do you do in cases where human rights framework and child rights framework is not a currency, it's not a legal currency that you can utilize in mitigation? Um, let alone when you try to expand uh, the applicability, for example, of the convention beyond the territorial border of a state, something that the Commission on the Rights of the Child has grappled with, has grappled with, um, with a Thunderbird communication uh, a couple of years ago. And, and, and now the new the draft general comment that you've mentioned is trying to like square the circle in that sense. Um, because the convention is pretty, is quite conservative in its, uh, in Article 1, it's how it, how it constructs uh, its jurisdiction. Um, but when it comes to climate justice, you, 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 you are trying to impose, uh, uh, um, some, uh, some duties, uh, on countries that, uh, for the implications of their actions or, or, or the negligence beyond their territorial borders. Um, and if Anola and our colleague wrote about also the interest of future generations and how they can be read into the convention or not. Um, and it requires some pretty creative interpretation when we try to read the interests of future generations into the convention. There are some other think other human rights mechanisms are doing a better job with that respect, at least according to, to what Ifa what Ifa Nolan uh, 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 wrote about it. Um, so, but then the, the question remains: I mean, if you are trying to to challenge current uh, legislation and practices through the court system, which is one way of doing advocacy and, and, and the limitations and, and pros and cons of those uh, uh, of these choices are known and, and well documented. Where does it put, I think the question is, where does it put children? Uh, and the question uh, uh, setting aside the question of, of representation, the way this group of children represents anyone, uh, um, like all the child court as, as a whole, um, what 
does a failure do to, to climate emergency? And, and, and if you accept the assertion that we are now in a time of, 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 of an emergency and, and, and immediate action is required now, because we reached a tipping point where if we don't change the course of things now, the crisis is, is looming, um, whether human rights-based litigation and human rights-based advocacy more generally uh, is the best cost of action. And if the answer is on the affirmative, the question of whether the convention is then provided with the, with the best tool uh, or the best platform to advance those, uh, to advance those claims. And, and I will finish with that. While, while we are kind of in agreement that the convention is, is, is a good tool to tackle new phenomena in children's living, but we spoke about online learning, I'm not that convinced that it does a good job in providing us the, the, the legal framework to tackle climate change. Um, in, in the, the gravity of the issues there and the complexity of the issues there are different than whether we go to school and sit in the classroom and scribble our notes or whether we take our laptop to school uh, uh, and do our homework online on, on like my standards on Google uh, Classroom. Um, we know how to handle it. We have the tools to handle the previous ones. I'm not sure the convention gives us a good and sufficient and comprehensive uh, uh, mechanism and a draft general comment is long, is detailed. But when you read it, you, you're on the one hand overwhelmed. I think the committee is trying to like to do a mm -hmm. really good job in expanding and providing some flesh on the bone on the one hand, but then you like sit down and you reflect on it and you're wondering what was that, right? Um, yeah. I, how I can I use it? How convincing it is it? It, it's really, it, it looks really good on first read, but I'm like the second or third time around, Mm. You need to be honest, and, and you wrote about it in the past. I mean, there's as much as we can read into the convention. Uh, mm. it, it can't, it's not the answer to all questions. And you wrote it like 15 years ago now, right? Yeah, um, that, that, no, I, I think you're right. And, I, and I, think, I think climate change is an example of that. And I think it's just around um, future generations, uh, international equity. Those are things that human rights law as a whole, not just the CRC hasn't dealt with because it, it wasn't really in the radar as well. And, and your point about it, is it convincing? Will it persuade people to think that a rights-based approach is the appropriate model to address climate change? I think that is one where we need to be doing some more work to actually make the case. And there was a, a, a phrase that refers to higher obligations within that um, general comment. And, and that's a new concept that I'm not aware of that it has a, as a, as a foundation in the text of the convention. It's much, we might want to have it and ask for it because it might suit our purpose. But that's the point you, I think you're making, Noam, that there may be some gaps there that we don't, we have to acknowledge, right? We, we can't, we can't assume that it is capable of addressing every issue. And if we try to stretch it too far, it loses credibility and legitimacy as well. So that's the point about reflection. Um, and I think that the climate change debate is an example of that as well. So some good challenges there. Conscious of time, I perhaps I should try and move to the third point, which I think um, is around the idea about how we might bring third world perspectives into thinking about the um, relevance of the convention as well and the broader claims around the universal relevance of the CRC. And I, I mean, this is that ongoing, enduring debate and, I, and, I, and we haven't got time to explore it in detail, but I think there's a few key points that I'd like to make um, and we can see where that takes us. I think first is that um, the convention itself as, a, as an instrument is a living instrument which is not static in the way in which we understand and interpret it as well. So um, we tend to have this obsession sometimes to think about all human rights as being the product of Western values and therefore they're locked in, like that's it. I find that sort of a bit frustrating because every interpretive process is an involving organic dynamic process, which over time we see differences, whether it's domestic law or of course international treaties like the convention as well. So my, my first thing is I, I, I think we have to be really careful about that claim. It's just a Western document. I think it's far too simplistic, both in the content that is in the convention. There's a, there's a very conscious attempt to try and be accommodating of culture, um, but then also in the process of interpretation, which then leads to the second point. I think there's enormous scope for new perspectives, third world perspectives, uh, to post colonial perspectives to come into how we understand and the various rights that exist under the convention. I, and I don't think that project is anywhere near complete. I think that's a really important conversation we need to be having. And certainly me as someone living in a Western country, given my background, that's something I'm conscious of that there needs to be more work to explore what that means and looks like. Um, the second point though, that I wanna make is that I, I think this, and I was marking a paper from a student who was writing around 
um, the critique of uh, the Indian government's construction of the girl child in India and its policies. And it, it was quite timely in that what she was saying was she took sort of the three models I talk about, a property-based approach, a welfare-based approach, and a rights-based approach to critique the Indian government's policies in the context of, you know, trying to also blend that with the uh, post-colonial um, theories of thinking. And she was able to reveal quite clearly that, in fact, um, what we saw within those policies, which would not be dissimilar what we see in Australia, there's strong elements of property-based conceptions of the girl-child and also welfare-based conceptions of the girl-child where we're rendering the girl very much an object, um, disempowered with limited capacity. And she highlighted, in fact, when you take a rights-based lens, you start to challenge that and you start to demand a much more active role for young girls to have greater agency and empowerment within their communities. And so for me, that was kind of both enlightening, um, but also reassuring that we can start to use the idea of a rights-based approach in ways that are culturally sensitive to challenge sort of whether it's colonial vestiges of colonialism in any context but also in jurisdictions where we might be trying to sort of subvert dominant power paradigms and that's what we're trying to do right we're trying to in a post-colonial world we're trying to say well, where's the power being exercised by whom and how do we break that down reveal those systems of power and i think in some respects if we start to um, um, imagine the capacity of the language of rights to play that role then we see the capacity for it to have a really significant impact on offering insights into how power is exercised in any community and in doing so I don't think we can just leave it as being simply a western construct I think it's too simplistic I think Sally Mary um, who's an anthropologist and talks about what she refers to as the vernacularization of rights and she did a lot of work within India within with um, women who are victims of family violence and how they would use that language to challenge those systems that rendered them you know, powerless and victims and transfer it to being, being powerful and survivors. And that vacularization, I think, is something that rights-based language when it comes to children can also have the capacity to do as well. I, I don't think we've finished that project at all, Norm. I think there's much to be done there as well. Um, but even with Australia, we're seeing now um, scholars working with Indigenous communities to similarly try and get them to be able to take the language of rights and use it as a tool for them to empower their communities very much through the, the process of voice, right? So, you know, as our viewers perhaps will not know, voice is a significant issue in Australia right now for all Indigenous peoples, a major um, proposal to incorporate um, the idea of Indigenous voice into our constitution. Ironically, Article 12 of the CRC is all about voice, isn't it? It's about elevating that voice to challenge established power dynamics to be heard and to as well, and have an effect on how things are done to affect the lives of children. So for me, I think, there's a project that's not complete yet. I, I think it's an under-theorized project. I think it needs a lot of work, but I do think there's something in particularly Article 12 uh, and the idea of giving children a voice within context for them to be constructing their own lives and their understandings of what rights might mean for them. So I, I don't take the view that it's simply a Western construct and it's kind of useless. I think on the contrary, I think there's enormous capacity to take Article 12 as a way of enabling, empowering and changing the way power structures exist in every society, um, uh, whatever that might be, you know, in remote communities in, in Indigenous Australia, or it could be, you know, uh, in India in its conception of how we deal with the girl child as well. So I, I think it's a really important point to raise. And I think certainly as a scholar, I want to do more work in this area to better understand what it means to think through lenses that aren't necessarily shaped just by my classic Western Anglo sort of background to realize the new insights that those perspectives might offer when we think about really giving serious impact to the voice of young people in those communities to challenge dominant power structures and recreate new systems, okay, that actually will lead to realization of children's rights, autonomy, capacity, et cetera, as well. So lots of work to be done there, I think. It's a really important point to raise. Um, but, I, but I, I'm optimistic that we can be doing something there that hasn't been done yet that may actually lead to outcomes that will empower those young people in those communities as well. But I'm very keen to get your thoughts as well. 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's an it's an it's an on, ongoing project which is still in a very much earlier stage. Uh, I think that it, it, we are we are at the point. I mean, we as, as a discipline at the point where there is a realization that a the convention is an item. It's not perfect. Um, it's it's a it's a living instrument, and we should incorporate voices of children. And it's part also as part of this decolonization of human rights and of the convention to begin with. Um, I think what is interesting is that the con the convention. Is often being accused of being a, a, a reflection of, of Western ideas, um, and, and therefore, by definition, it's not applicable or not relevant to the life of children in the global South, uh, 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 broadly defined. Um, but I think it's it's more than that. It, it, it's a it, it's an invocation of adults' ideas from adults from the West. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's adults' perspective uh, of what child rights should be. Uh, um, adults of the eighties. Uh, yeah. So in that thing, I think when we are trying to decolonize the field and, and, and rethink the convention from that perspective, uh, uh, we should also remember that children weren't part of the drafting process to begin with, also children of the, of the global north, uh, of, of the West, uh, yeah. and the process of, 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 of unraveling and unpacking uh, and scratching the surface of the convention or rethink the conventions and its underpinning con uh, conceptions to involve children from everywhere. Um, including and especially those who were marginalized uh, uh, and already marginalized to begin with, children from the global south, but are not the only group of children uh, who are marginalized. Yes. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to draw any hierarchies here, um, but, but, but I have to try to, to, to suggest that from a child rights perspective and from children's perspective, this entire project is, is an adult-led project. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and, and therefore, uh, um, it, it, a critical approach will will invite children and utilize Article Twelve uh, around the globe, um, yeah. and we have colleagues who have, who have done this work, like Laurel Andy and her team, uh, has been writing a lot about uh, speculating what would have been how the convention would have looked like uh, if children were involved in its drafting, and their findings from their participatory projects are are very interesting. Um, and even some and some of the writings that we have today in the scholarship that we have today, like I'm thinking about the book that Manfred Label uh, established a few years ago. Uh, one of his key messages is get children involved in the process of, of, of uh, making sense of their life and how they conceptualize rights and agencies and, and their understanding of how um, of how the rights should uh, should look like or be understood in the context of their own living and their own living experiences and their families and their and their communities. Um, and I will end with, I think, with, with la one last point, which is the duty that we have as teachers um, yeah. with respect to our curricula and how we teach uh, this subject. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what was the, what are the canonic texts that we, are, that we are presenting to our students, the sort of discussions we are having in class, um, what sort of voices do we bring into the classroom um, as, and in, in, in broadening the field. And, and when you're educating the next generation of child rights scholars or practitioners, um, we I think we have the responsibility of making sure that we, we are providing them with a better, a more rounded view of, of the discipline um, and of this body of law, um, yeah. which I think yeah, and reflecting on our own reading lists is, is crucial in that, um, yeah. in that space. Um, which I think is a it's a great segue to the next to the last point I think we should uh, uh, we're going to discuss today, uh, which is if we have had the opportunity if you had the opportunity of putting an agenda item in front of the committee of the rights of the child, mm -hmm. um, and offering and uh, to adopt or to draft a new mm -hmm. um, optional protocol, what mm -hmm. would be mm -hmm. the topic that you would ask them to to tackle? Oh, that's a very difficult question. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a point now. I'm getting old enough and cynical <laughs> enough to wonder: Do we need any more optional protocols for children? So, um, I worry that we haven't fully understood and fully taken advantage of what the convention offered for us in the first instance. And does draft another treaty give us, you know, I suppose the clarity we might be seeking to address some of the challenges we've identified. So, you know, I haven't mentioned the optional protocols and obviously they were done because of a glaring, um, you know, catastrophe is the wrong word, but maybe it is the right word in terms of how the sale of children and armed conflict were really impacting on children's lives. So there's a need to have greater clarity to address those two areas and put more pressure on states as well. You know, in some respects, it's not for me to answer that question though, I think is a critical thing as a middle-aged white privileged professional um it's the sort of thing that we go back to what we've just talked about if if children were to give the opportunity to ask for a document that reflected their interests their concerns what might that look like that that would be fascinating i think to, to be honest um you know you and i could speculate about you know 
a protocol on business and human rights or climate change and human rights or, or online um, living or learning, whatever it might be as well, online learning environments. Um, but again, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to sort of answer that question um, just because I think I, I should be listening rather than telling on that space as well, if that makes sense. So it's perhaps a cop out, um, but I think it's a good question to ask the viewers, you know, what are the gaps that we see in the international normative framework when it comes to children's rights and how do we best address those gaps? Do we try and expand um, the interpretation of existing principles under the convention as we're doing, I think, a bit with the climate change debate? Are we, are we stretching it so far that it becomes implausible and not particularly persuasive? Um, and if so, what do we have to do to fill that gap, I think, is a really important consideration. So, you know, I, I, or, or do we take a topic, as I said, um, uh, social media, um, juvenile youth justice, there's so many potential areas um, where we could be doing and having more specificity and more detail about how we go about shaping the landscape that tries to put pressure on states, policymakers, NGOs, et cetera, to do things in ways which we think more along closely with the rights-based approach. But I'm, I'm going to balk a bit of that, known, which is a bit of a coward's act in some respects, but I think it's an important conversation in the broader sense of saying, so, you know, if if someone was to look back now at our, so 20 years since, I look back and say, what, what should we have done now that we weren't doing? What was happening that was so significant that we failed to act? That I think is a question we should always be asking of ourselves, you know, because I think as adults, we tend to miss things sometimes. And that goes right back to your point around children actually didn't draft the convention. It was an adult-led initiative. And not to say that it means it's not useful, but there are deficiencies in what we've constructed and, Perhaps part of the next process is rectifying those deficiencies, whether it's through an optional protocol, whether it's through interpretive guidance, I'm not too sure. But I think that constant reflection on what are the gaps, what do we have to do to address those gaps, I think is a really important exercise at all times, to be honest. Yeah. So it's a cop out. Apologies. <laughs> if you've got a view, I'd be keen to hear it. I'd be very keen to hear it. <laughs> No, I mean, I, 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 after your answer, I can possibly structurally uh, offer any any of our protocol, right? We should defer it to children. I think it's a, it's a, uh, um, and think, and also, I mean, but taking your points uh, seriously, I think the committee in its current mode of operation and composition is in a position where it might be willing to undertake this 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 endeavor. Um, yeah. You've mentioned the participation process that they had with respect to this looming general comment about children's rights and the environment. Um, and they might be interested and have the appetite to engage in a similar consultation process with children uh, yep. as to how the next phase of the convention uh, might look like, um, which I think will be in a major statement from within the UN rights framework, the, U the UN treaty body system mm -hmm. uh, will be a strong message as to how child rights should look uh, in the future and the involvement that children should have in their own life and in shaping their own life. Uh, yeah. including their, their life as, as object and subjects to, to international child rights law. Um, so with this glimpse of optimism, maybe it's time to bring this conversation into an end. Uh, yeah. Professor John Tobin yeah. of the University of Melbourne, thank you very much for this illuminating uh, talk and conversation. And I hope that our audience have learned something from it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Noam. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you.